Diaz, Solarte, um, and they have prospects. Donaldson's going to be back eventually, Prospects on their way. So, I mean, not necessarily a better situation for him, but obviously the Blue Jays like him, so we'll see what happens. If he ends up playing a bit, you know, he's going to be someone worth paying attention to in, in deeper mixed leagues again. So, you know, I keep an eye out for that. And then uh, just to run through some some other things that happened, the Cubs acquired reliever Jesse Chavez from the A's for pitching prospect Tyler Thomas. Uh, the Diamondbacks got Matt Andrees from the Rays for prospects Brian Schaefer and Michael Perez. The Astros got catcher Martin Maldonado from the As- or for from the Angel or the yeah from the Angels for pitching prospect Patrick Sandoval. That one just happened on Thursday afternoon. Uh, it sounds like Max Stassi is going to remain the the primary catcher in Houston, but Maldonado is a really good defensive catcher, and and so there's some value in that that that, that a smart team like the Astros can take advantage of in spots. Um, and then late last week, the Royals picked up outfielder Brian Goodwin from the Nationals for for a pitching prospect. No major fantasy fallout to any of these. I, I guess Goodwin could take on some value in deeper leagues. Yeah, I'm into in an that. Everyday, yeah, in, in an everyday role in Kansas City, but you know, also you can do just do a lot better than that mm-hmm. uh, with outfielders. But yeah, maybe, maybe I could see him getting hot finally in an everyday role. Yeah, um, and he should so, play a lot too. So yeah, you know, deeper mixed leagues worth a shot. He he had 13 homers and an 811 OPS for the Nationals last season. Also stole six bases in 74 games. So there's some counting stat ability there. Um, We're obviously going to have a lot more deals to talk about uh, this time next week once the trade deadline's pass, but we're going to get into some more headlines here in a second. Before we do that, if you love fantasy baseball, then you need to try our new favorite app. It's called Draft. It's daily fantasy baseball, but not like the other guys. On Draft, you play live snake drafts with other people, just like in your season-long league. Drafts are for just one night, and once you're done drafting, that's it. No trades, no waiver wire. You just set it and forget it. And the best part... Play for cold, hard cash and get paid out the next day. Drafts start from just $1, so there's really a draft for everyone. As a longtime fantasy player, I found this game to be the best of both worlds. Yes, you can utilize your typical instincts from a snake draft setup and put together a lineup of stars that you can feel good about, but there's plenty of room for strategy too, whether you want to stack hitters against a specific pitcher or target a specific ballpark on a specific day. So there's room for multiple approaches, which is what makes constructing these lineups so fun and easy as well. Join us on Draft today. Just search Draft in your app store or play right from your computer on Draft.com. And for a limited time only, all Roto World listeners will get a free entry into a real money baseball draft when you make your first deposit. But you have to use our promo code RW. That's right, play a real money game for free just for using promo code RW when you make your first deposit. That's RW for Roto World. Search Draft in your app store to check it out for yourself. Okay, so we have a ton of big injury news this week, and I'll get us started here with Ioannis Cespedes. Uh, He's set for season-ending surgery on both of his heels. Will be two separate procedures, one two to three months after the other, but The goal is to eliminate calcifications and bone spurs in his heels, and this is something that Cespedes has been dealing with for a long time, and the Mets think that the heel issue may have caused him to compensate potentially in his running style, so sort of a cascade effect with all the leg issues he's had in recent years, and the hope that this surgery will solve that, but the downside is that Cespedes is expected to miss 8 to 10 months, perhaps more, so his absence could stretch well into the first half next year, maybe who knows, all-star break even, and who knows what it'll be when he comes back either, and uh, that's a big deal for the Mets, Cespedes is owed $58.5 million over the next two seasons, uh, and you know, if you can't count on him to be there next year and to be the player that he was before, I think the Mets are faced with some really important decisions this offseason, expected a search for a new general manager, and they're going to have a lot on their plate, uh, potentially deciding the futures of Jacob deGrom and Noah Syndergaard, You know, should they trade those guys? I think at this point, it's, I think they should explore it. Um, So it might be rebuilding time there in Queens. Uh, Also about Syndergaard, he's sidelined right now with hand, foot, and mouth disease, which is a very Mets thing to happen. Uh, Usually a disease just associated with, you know, little kids in daycare. Um, Daycare, yeah. yeah. Uh, That's a constant fear of mine, actually. Um, But Syndergaard, apparently he caught this at a youth camp that he was helping out at during the all-star break and uh he left his start early um last friday and it was a little little odd to see him leave early and it turned out that 
he was just really uncomfortable on the on the mound. He had these red bumps on his hands. He said he had trouble breathing. Uh, fortunately, it sounds like he could be back really, really soon, uh, potentially as soon as next week against the Nationals. So not a long-term thing, but just a, just a weird thing, just a Mets thing, really. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Maybe this podcast is better when the teams we root for aren't, aren't any good. Though. I think that's really true, actually. Um, so I, I talked up Gary Sanchez during last week's podcast in which we discussed first half disappointments and we're looking ahead to players who should bounce back in the second half. You know, I was feeling pretty good about him finishing strong, but he landed back on the disabled list on Tuesday after re-aggravating the right groin strain that cost him the final three weeks of the first half. Yankees GM Brian Cashman said he'll probably be out until late August or early September. Um, so a big blow to that opportunity of, of finishing strong. Um, Sanchez you know, has 14 home runs and 42 RBIs in 66 games this season, but he's batting just 188 with a 283 on base percentage. Been a pretty big disappointment overall. Was supposed to be the clear number one option at catcher, uh, but currently ranks eighth in standard scoring leagues and obviously will, will continue to fall now. Austin Romine will serve as the Yankees' primary catcher for the next four-plus weeks, you know, unless the Yankees upgrade the position before the trade deadline, which is possible, but there just aren't a ton of great options out there. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, they're not going to go after JT Real Muto. Uh, I guess maybe Wilson Ramos, but there, I think there are better fits for Ramos out there. Nationals. Um, so, or, well, who yeah. knows if they're even going for it anymore. Yeah. yeah, but even beyond that, I mean, there are contenders that mm-hmm. need catching help. Yeah. Um, and I, and I think, I mean, the Yankees will expect Sanchez to be there in September and, and to be their primary guy during the playoffs, I would think, unless unless there's something to that idea that he, like, doesn't hustle. But I, I'm just not going to buy into that storyline. Mm-hmm. Um, I think they, they consider him a pretty important part of, of what they have going on up there. They should. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, But, you know, assuming Romine does hold down this job through August, I think he's relevant in two catcher leagues, maybe some deeper, like 14-team, one-catcher leagues. Has a 789 OPS, six home runs, and 28 RBIs in 43 games this season. Um, you know, hitting towards the bottom of the lineup, but it's, it's a good and deep lineup, so there could be some counting stats there, and he's shown some good power. Uh, so if you're desperate at catcher, I, I don't think he's a bad option. Another high-profile player headed back to the disabled list, Steven Strasburg with the Nationals. Of course, he missed about six weeks with uh, inflammation in his pitching shoulder before returning last Friday against the Braves. He gave up six runs in four and two-thirds innings in that start, and perhaps the most notable thing coming out of that start was the argument that he got in with Max Scherzer in the dugout, but it turns out a lot more came out of that. Uh, Strasburg was scheduled to take the mound Thursday against the Marlins, but the Nationals announced that he's headed to the disabled list again, this time due to a pinched nerve in his neck. Uh, we don't have a ton of details on the injury or the timetable just yet, but it'll be interesting to see if this could be related to the shoulder issue, just the neck to the shoulder. I mean, it's it's possible that there could be some connection there, but we'll have to just wait and see about the, the timetable for his return. Uh, either way, bad news for the Nationals, who are, I believe, seven games out in the NL East right now. Um, Tommy Malone is taking Strasburg's spot in the rotation on Thursday against the Marlins. Favorable matchup, but doesn't exactly bring a ton of confidence. And suddenly, man, like the Nationals look like they should be sellers. Um, Jeff Passan of Yahoo Sports had a report Thursday afternoon. The Nationals have started gauging interest in their players if they decide to sell. I think this weekend will be critical in that decision. But uh, relievers Kelvin Herrera, Sean Kelly, and Ryan Madsen are drawing the most interest, according to Passan. And, you know, those guys are all impending, impending free agents. But so is another guy who's not mentioned in that report, and that's Bryce Harper. Um, mm-hmm. You know, could the Nationals really trade him? I, I don't know. But, I mean, if they realistically don't think they can make it, I, I think they have to explore it, right? Yeah, I mean, does it hurt their chances of signing him in the offseason? I wouldn't think it does. I think it's just going to be all about money. Yeah, I mean, and also, I think you're sort of doing him a favor by putting him in a place that he could win. But then again, sure. if he goes and wins somewhere else, he might be like, man, I kind of like it here. And, yeah. you know, that could be a factor, too. So I guess I could see both sides of it. But, you know, if, if Harper walks and the Nationals just get the, you know, draft pick compensation, I mean, meanwhile, they could net sort of something similar to what Machado did. I mean, I think it's a, a legitimate debate to have. I think it I think it would make a lot of sense if, if, if they're 
three games under 500 after the weekend. Um, now, I've seen a lot I mean, of people the, saying the A's should make a run at him. Why not? It'd be sweet. It'd be awesome. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I don't, it that seems like Get a very, very, yeah, very non-A's move, but I, that would be great. Yeah. Um, I, and, he, and he probably wouldn't stay in Oakland. I don't know. <laughs> shell out $400 million point. dollars for him. That's a good point. <laughs> um, so another, uh, major injury, Chris Bryant, um, you missed nearly three weeks between late June and mid July with inflammation in his left shoulder. And then the Cubs placed him back on the disabled list on Thursday morning with the very same issue. Obviously wasn't over it, isn't over it yet. And the Cubs want to get him right for the stretch run. There's no timetable yet. Uh, you yeah, know, he's not he's not going to be activated until he's fully healthy this time around, I would imagine. An MRI is scheduled, should have more clarity on what exactly is going on by, you know, Friday or sometime this weekend. Could be another two or three weeks, maybe even more. Um, it's been a you know relatively disappointing year for Brian. OPS down over 90 points from where it was in 2017. 11 home runs, 44 RBIs in 76 games. Definitely not the level of fantasy production you want from a late first, high second round pick, uh, which is kind of where he was going in drafts this spring. David Bote was recalled from AAA Iowa on Thursday as as the corresponding move for move for when Bryant was placed on the disabled list. Bote has done some impressive things at the major league level this season. A really good batting line uh, in, in limited s- sample size, but he'll probably share time. Um, at third base with Ian Happ, who got the start there on Thursday afternoon, and, and also Tommy Listella. So I don't know if there's any fantasy upside really to this situation. Uh, we saw a setback for Mariners left-hander James Paxton this week as he tries to return from lower back inflammation. Uh, that landed him on the DL just prior to the All-Star break. Paxton was originally scheduled to return on Tuesday against the Giants, but it turned out his back stiffened up on him after throwing a bullpen session over the weekend. So Mariners wanted to play things safe here. Paxton is expected to test himself again this weekend with another bullpen session and, and see where he is at, the, at that time. But if all goes well, he could rejoin the rotation next week against the Astros. So uh, we'll see how, see, how, see how things go this weekend. Uh, Paxton owns a 3.70 ERA over 20 starts this season, 155 strikeouts and 119 in the third innings. Uh, the Mariners are clinging to a one and a half game lead over the Athletics for the second AL wild card spot right now, so they need Paxton back ASAP for sure. And, and Cubs closer Brandon Morrow was placed on the disabled list last Thursday with inflammation in his right biceps. Uh, still hasn't picked up a baseball one week later. Obviously, won't be ready to come off the disabled list when first eligible this weekend. Definitely a concerning situation for a guy who's had all sorts of arm injuries throughout his career. Cubs manager Joe Madden said he'll play the matchups with save opportunities in Morrow's absence, but it's been Pedro Strope uh, getting those chances over the last seven days for the most part. Um, Carl Edwards Jr. and Steve Ciszek could also be in the mix. Maybe even newcomer Jesse Chavez, uh, but I think I'd want to own Strope most uh, of those four names with Ed- Edwards probably a close second. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Any other uh, not, random notes? Yeah, I, I should add this. Uh, it, it came out just before we started recording. Jesse Winker, who I is another person I said you know to look for in the second half. You know, re- re- really good podcast. Like, yeah, Jesse running Winker. out of dudes, man. Yeah, <laughs> I know. But uh, yeah, the Reds announced this afternoon that he he needs season-ending surgery on his right shoulder. Um. Yeah, looked to be in a good position to put up useful numbers down the stretch in Cincinnati, but just obviously that won't happen now. Finishes the year with a 299 batting average, 405 on base percentage, 836 OPS in 89 games. Uh, hopefully he's good for the start of the 2019 season. We, we don't really know what exactly he's having repaired. If it's major shoulder surgery, he might not be ready for, for the start of, the, of next season, but pretty well-rounded talent, a big part of the future for the Reds, a guy who hasn't posted a ton of counting stats, like home runs and stolen bases, but he's, he's good in both of those areas. And I think eventually he will be a a pretty useful fantasy outfielder. I think the third guy you mentioned last week was John Gray. Uh, He had another good start the other day, but uh, I guess he needs to cover himself in in bubble wrap right (laughs) now. Yeah. Um, Let's move along. Uh, some some 
some other items. Uh, the Lino to Shields, you know, opened the 2018 season as the Rangers. 